Thank you, uh, Professor Hillier. Uh, thank you, uh, Tim, uh, Adi, Sharon, everyone at COGIT for uh, accommodating uh, uh, this uh, Zoom session uh, because of uh, uh, illness. Uh, uh, I'll do my, my best here. Can we maybe get the lights down? That might help. Mum. I, me, mine. The people, people, the, the people, people, people are, are talking, talking about, about, you, you, me, me, about, me, me, hi, 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 mum, mum, hi, mum, mum, hi. Now his face is like the hair marked moon. My wife, wife, my, my wife, wife, sits, 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 my, my wife, wife, sits, sits, by my, and me, and me, is my, and me, and me, my, my, and me, and me, hi, 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 mama, mama, hi, mama, mama, hi. Now his face is like the hair marked moon. Abandon her. Her. Abandon, abandon her, 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 where, where the, the earth, earth is desolate, desolate, earth is desolate, desolate. Hi, 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 mama, mama, hi, mama, mama, hi. Now his face is like the hair marked moon. One poetry. One, one, a. In his lectures of 1951 to the School of Oriental and African Studies, the French Indologist Louis Renaud notes that the principle of relationship is the signatory feature of the syncretic Indic corpus. It designates a form of existence from which one cannot release oneself. Yet, it must be affirmed periodically. Ritual texts call on priest magicians to incant occult taxonomies linking incongruous events and entities, e.g. sun and goose, horse and tear, Later works stress vigilance against states of mind, causing us to forget the influence of relationship in everyday life. 1.1 B. Moments of clarification or nominal performativity, let's call it, are uniquely hazardous. These occur when there is a tangible consummation of an action, thought, or feeling. Say, when an intention results in an actual lifestyle change, or when we hit on a preconceived mental script to hypostasize vague phenomena floating about in our head, or when we achieve a hard and fast sense of discrete identity and purpose. I, me, mine, I'm the kind of person who, and so on. The early Buddhist monk, Buddha Gosha, lists various um, auguries of clarification, volition, applied thought, concentration. All such bring pleasure and value to life, yet they can trigger a traumatic experience of separation for the person who has undergone the moment of clarification and collaterally for others in their relational milieu. The said experiences of separation are in essence experiences of injury, and um, violence. 1.2a, the anguish of collateral separation is a favored theme in South Asian mysticisms, Islam and Hinduism included. It is portrayed as a condition to which women identified entities are vulnerable on account of single-minded male protagonists who have either given over to one or other clearly demarcated mindset, anger, jealousy, moral fervor, or over-identified with this or that clearly demarcated social role and function, kingship, renunciation, the export-import business. Um, the um, Jaina uh, corpus has uh, many apologues to this point. In one story, the hero, Neminatha, 
a diehard convert to vegetarianism, abandons his betrothed, Rajmati, on the eve of their wedding after a vision of uh, the animals his uh, future father-in-law will slaughter for the marriage feast. A 1.2b. Another example comes from popular iterations of an episode from the ancient epic poem, the Ramayanam of Valmiki. Prince Rama of Ayodhya orders his brothers to abandon his wife, Sita of Mithila, in a desolate place. His edict is provoked by gossip amongst the people of the realm about the impropriety of Sita's restitution as wife consort, given her association with another man, her violent abductor, Ravana, king of Lanka. Rama's action, swift and irreversible, this very day Sita must be taken away from here, is often explained as a concomitant of his inflexible commitment to an emerging norm of righteous kingship. The rule of Rama, where accountability to those who count as the governed must be prized above all things at any cost. 1.3a. Between 1939 and 1940, W.G. Archer, a British colonial official and amateur ethnographer, began to collect village women's songs from the Mithila region of Bihar in eastern India. Archer's fieldwork followed in the footsteps of a predecessor, the imperial civil servant George Grierson, best known as superintendent of the Linguistic Survey of India. Grierson had a particular interest in the vernacular literature of rural Bihar. In the 1870s, he came across a genre of female complaint about marriage, in which solidification of affect between a, a man, woman, and their clans is portrayed as a state of separation from the unformed pleasures of childhood. It anticipates the final rupture of self and world. The wedding songs compiled by Archer also portray marriage as an experience of bereavement for the bride. These uh, differ from Grierson's collection in one respect. Where Grierson's samples revolve around the legend of Krishna, archers typically emphasize the breakdown of the Rama-Sita marriage as a prototype. Many songs are of warning signs for things to come observed by Sita's female kin, even in early stages of wedding negotiations between the houses of Ayodhya and Mithila. 1.3b. Rama's family asks too much in dowry. Rama wants a bond. The bridegroom smiles with a knife in his hand. This daughter is my enemy. Not even an enemy should have a daughter. 1.3c. When my aunt Veena died, a very close friend of hers drove to Pondicherry from Bangalore to join other mourners. On an especially bleak but electric evening, charged with the desperate vitality of survivors in such circumstances, he sang a lamentation from the genre described above. The song, Babula Mora Neihar Chuto Hijai, was composed by the Nawab Wajid Ali Shah in 1850. The occasion was his deposition on order of the British resident of the East India Company in the course of historic events leading to the consolidation of colonial power in India. <laughs> Vajidali's composition likens his own expulsion from the city of Lucknow to the leave-taking ceremony for a newly minted bride. It is sung as often at wakes as at weddings. Babula Mura Nayhar Chutahi Jai. 
1.3D. My father. My home slips away. Four ball bearers lift my palanquin. Your court is a mountain now. Your door is a foreign place. <coughs> 1.4a. A famous opening episode of, of the Valmiki Ramayanam is all about the toxic nexus of clarification, nominal performativity, and separation. The forest-dwelling ascetic Valmiki is about to begin morning ablutions on the banks of the Tamasa River. His delight at the promise of bath time is boosted by the billing and cooing of a pair of Kronjata birds. These massive non-migratory Saras cranes were a known species of the open wetlands of ancient South Asia. They are still extant in the region and believed to mate for life. Suddenly, an arrow dispatched by a hunter from the indigenous Nishada community kills one of the birds. Moved by the lamentations of the bereaved crane, Valmiki curses the hunter that he too may be forever separated from the world. Ma Nishada, 1.4b, since Nishada, you have killed one of this pair of Kronichas, distracted at the height of passion. You will not live long. 1.4c. Regret comes swiftly to Valmiki. And even as he stood watching and spoke in this way, this thought arose in his heart, stricken with grief for this bird. What is this I have uttered? Valmiki's curse. Any curse is a textbook example of performative language. It is a primal hate speech act in which what is spoken is as good or as bad as done. Something unexpected occurs. Valmiki realizes his utterance has acquired a life of its own. What actually comes out of his mouth is a sonic diffraction of the linguistic violence intended by the original malediction. The semantic clarity of the discrete words spoken and their logical word order are confounded by a spontaneous braiding and euphonic relation, i.e. based on pleasing sound alone, of quantitatively equivalent syllables in metrical feet. Meaning is superseded by a pure sound fit for the accompaniment of stringed and percussion instruments. Such an utterance is poetry and nothing else, says Valmiki. This definition of poetry abides long after the Ramayana. A seminal work on performance arts describes a poem just so as a sentence wherein words are evacuated of linguistic properties till all that remains is a strictly incomprehensible residue of musical notes and beats. 1.4D, poetry and nothing else. 1.4E, Sinishada, you hoove, you wool, not lihi heave, vihirihi, la 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 la, luhu lahu, la long li long li long. 1.4 F. Valmiki's poetic breakthrough is a byproduct of the principle of sandhi, joining, euphonic assimilation, common to many languages. Late 19th century European linguists noted the unique frequency with which Sandhi occurs in Sanskrit and derived dialects. The term covers the wide array of sound and meaning changes at word boundaries caused by combinations between perceptually distinct sonic units and across semantically distinct lexical units in any text or utterance. 1.4G, a sandhi led idiom controverts the independent self-value of words and the distinctness of one word from another. It upholds a conception of language as a gathering of words sitting by each other in a maze of relationships. Sandhi is celebrated on this basis in early texts as a linguistic corollary of cosmic welding. 
It is like this as far as worlds are concerned. The first world is earth, the second world is sky, and space is the Sunday between them. 1.48, the principle of, of relationality advanced by Sunday has another dividend. It makes language polysemic and unstable. Infinite combinations of speech sounds, phonemes, yield new words, words and words for things that may never exist or come about. This makes it difficult to presume settled meanings and renders all such interminable. The resource is not helpful to everyone who trades in words, e.g. writers of instruction manuals. For poets such as Valmiki, however, it opens a different view on how language may change the realities it describes. If some types of words make things happen, a shape-shifting language goes a step further. It is prophylactic and can avert a guaranteed happening it is reparative and can unravel what has happened already. It is aspirational and can set forth alternatives within apparently intractable circumstances. 1.4i, the disposition is intolerant of immutability. The presupposition of variability is not confined to the belief that base elements are convertible into purer elements. The onus is on continuities between base and pure elements in either direction. 1.5a. Transmutation is a powerful motif in the Valmiki Apocrypha especially in folklore surrounding his status as a patron saint of sweepers. This term, sweeper, is a relic of colonial census operations. It came into vogue at the end of the 19th century and was used to designate so-called untouchable Dalit castes redeployed for sanitation work in urban municipal corporations following events of dispossession from agricultural labor. Such groups were subject to a great deal of ethnographic prurience. A classic work of 1894, Our Grievance, Knights of the Broom, details a subaltern cult of Balmiki amongst scavengers. In Legends Gathered by Grieven, the Balmiki life story figures as a sort of dream work made up of shreds and patches from the creation of poetry episode in the Ramayana. The protagonist goes through a series of threshold experiences. Instead of passing successfully from one proper place or state to another, he becomes threshold like himself, a gathering of social and sonic anomalies. 1.5b, a high-born child, Muslim in some accounts, Hindu in others, gets lost in a forest. He is rescued by a scavenger called Revolution. She teaches him how to convert waste into reusable material and harness nutrients in dead matter. A famine settles on the land. The scavenger becomes a hunter. The animals perish in a drought. The hunter becomes a murderer. One day, he sets on a band of ascetics. They plead for their lives and urge the murderer to mend his ways through repetition of a mantra. But try as he might, the murderer cannot get his mouth around any of the numinous phonemes uh, recommended by the ascetics. He settles on the word he knows best, mara, meaning hill. He sits on the ground chanting Mara for roughly 63,000 years. An anthill or Valmika forms around him and covers him entirely. When the ascetics return to the same spot, they hear sounds issuing from the anthill. Some hear the word for kill, Mara. Others can only make out an established one syllable seed sound reputed to bring an end to destruction. Ram, only incidentally, the, the, the name of the eponymous hero of the Ramayana. <laughs> A few hear the tangle of both articulations. Mara, 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 Mara. 
when they dismantle the anthill, there are no remains. The murderer has become the sound of the coincidence of opposites and nothing else. They call this sound Valmiki. Nearly done. Two, grammar. Two, one, a. Sandhi-led expression was not to everyone's taste. The ancient Indic language sciences, phonetics, lexicography, etymology, grammar, arose as part of an effort to arrest the morphological confusion caused by the running euphonic texts of the prevailing oral tradition, set down in works called Vedas, knowledge. According to early linguists, Vedic hymns were meant as precise ritual formulae for precise ends, no more, no less. Their linguistic corruption over time imperiled ritual performance. Endlessly fungible words recited in a low voice akin to the buzzing and humming of insects and birds resulted in nonsensical articulations impossible to effectuate. 2.1b. The word for grammar, vyakarana, means to separate. Grammar is that process by which division is carried out everywhere, according to a medieval commentator. Duly, vyakarana was associated with the principle of separation in spheres beyond language sciences. In moral philosophy, it was linked to powers of discrimination and given the mascot of a mythical bar-headed goose who can separate milk from water when the two are mixed. 2.1 D. At source, protogrammarians took up vyakarana as a type of word surgery with the single aim of splitting the agglutinate form of a Vedic text into a sequence of isolated words. They extracted discrete verbal units such as indeclinables, root and base words with standalone meanings from the inchoate textual matter of the Vedic corpus. Compound words were divided into component parts, meaning modifying affixes were excised from the beginning or end of root stems or words, a type of remedial recitation, augmented word boundaries through enacted cuts and pauses after each strongly enunciated word. 2.1e. Since her, uh, her, 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 cut, nisha, the ya, 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 her. Cut, killed, her, 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 cut. Kronachya, ya, 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 her. You, her, cut. Will, her, cut. Not, her, cut. Live, ya, 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 her. Period. 2.2a. When Louis Renault was working on lectures positing relationship as the core value of Indic heritage, he developed a strong interest in Vyakarana. With his first ever French translation of the Ashtadhyayi by Panini, arguably the oldest available work of grammar from the pre-modern world, Renaud joined leading 20th century linguists, Socio Jakobsen, in the view that grammar is the apex of Indic civilization. Other works, co-authored with a mentee, Lillian Silburn, focus on anomalous aspects of grammatical arts. 2.2b. In their work together, Ronald and Silburn argue that the Vyakarana quest for intelligible speech expands into a preference for all notions with definite structure, outline, and shape. A form, let's call it. Coupled with a preference for perfective actions, verbal and nonverbal, toward exact ends, the project is in breach of the befuddling of shapes and consequences, whereby relationship, in Renaud's sense of the term, gains force as a prolegomenon to uninjurability. Yet, and here's the main takeaway, the values of separation clarification encoded in grammatical arts do not ultimately trump principles of relationship indefiniteness traversing the Indic long durée. 2.2c. To this point, the authors identify an ambivalence about explicative formulae 
deep within the ritual context of Vyakarana. Pertinent manuals are clear. The plain designation of this God, that aim, this offering, none other, ensures perfection of a sacrifice or speech act. Yet such designations can open up a hostile zone beset with fears of harm and injury. 2.2D, the specified God may have an off day. Dearly wished for cattle may perish. Plainly stated wishes bring on terrors of exposure straight from the unconscious. If a man should utter aloud the recitation, then if one were to say of him he will become afflicted with a skin disease, it will be so. Such fears are forestalled within the ritual format through routinized indeterminacy. Distinct expressions are doubled with silent recitation or indistinct phonation, nasal sounds, random interjections, swaha, an offering of quantifiable substances is offset by a scattering of sand, unnumbered, unlimited, swaha, 2.2e. Honors and Silburn's predilection for an ethos of a relationship over clarification was at odds with a leading intellectual current of their era. In the late 1940s, French intellectual circles experienced a repopularization of Hegel's philosophy by way of two publications. Kojève's introduction to the reading of Hegel and Hippolyte's uh, Genesis and Structure of Hegel's Phenomenology. Both writers stress Hegel's hierarchy of so-called organic and inorganic entities, wherein only the organic have the capacity to actualize their soul given terminal form, identity, in duration. This is an axiomatically violent process built on partitions between self-other, master-enslaved, enslaved earth. Unlike inorganic entities, birds, uh, e.g., who cannot pass the juncture between air and wings, human organic entities achieve uh, definition through self-differentiation from their milieu and by overcoming their flabby internal heterogeneity, glad, sad, man, woman, both and neither, not yet. An organic being, a la Hegel, emerges in opposition. It disavows fluidity, it preserves itself, it separates itself. Renaud and Silburn uh, reverse such Hegelian postulates in favor of enigmatic connective energies. By their account, the key instructive heft of Indic speculative thought lies in a contrasting effort to specify beyond well-known things, beyond definite forms, a hidden zone where things and forms take on an inorganic aspect. A review of their researches uh, from this time notes their contribution. Sotto voce. There is nothing so far removed from our Western conception, systemized by Hegel and his heirs. Thank you very much. <laughs>